So um, if you're joining, just stay muted. And we're going to start with a little intro first. How many of you have heard of this new book that's out? Just raise your hand so I could see you if you're there. All right. Hot off the press, another book about the Passover Seder. Yeah. However, um, this book is really kind of extraordinary. I've been reading it. And the section I'm reading here is about the four children. So what I'd like to do for a moment is just um, share with you something I discovered. Oh, look, there's Marion with the book and Lee with the book. All right. Great. So I'm going to just, our discussion today is about the artwork of the four children. I'm not discussing the actual text in the Haggadah but more a reaction to the text through art through the ages. But what I am going to do now is just read the question for the Russia, who they call the evil, the wicked child, evil or wicked. And it says, Russia, Mahu Amer. So what does the wicked child say? And, um, and here in this Haggadah, which I think is fabulous, it's the third iteration of the one from Israel, A Different Night. And it says here, um, you know, and they have great pictures. Here's the, the four children as the Marx brothers. I'm sure some of you have seen this. Yeah. 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 Anyhow, so it says here, he doesn't call him wicked. He said, wicked or alienated child says, what, whatever does this service, this Passover Seder mean to you? And then the, um, the narrator says, or the answer is, um, so for us, not him. He's emphasizing you and not him or herself, according to this PC Haggadah. Since the child excludes him or herself from the community and rejects a major principle of faith, you should set his or her teeth on edge and say. Um, that's a very interesting expression. And it's, you see that expression, hakhe et shinav the emarlo, three times in the Tanakh. So it's a very curious expression. And then the parent is supposed to say, It's because of this that God did for me when I went free from Egypt. And then you have this horrible second part, which I just really don't like. Lee below low, for me, but not for you. And actually, it says here, not for that one over there, had that one over there been, um, she had that one been there, she or he would not have been redeemed. Okay, so just to raise a hand, those of you that have your face up, how many of you have always kind of like cringed at this answer to this child? Oh, okay, not too many. How many of you kind of didn't mind the answer? Raise your hand. How many of you have never thought about it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what happens is I've always cringed at this answer. I've not been happy with it ever. I don't think you take a child who's rebellious or alienated or questioning and say, if you were there, you would still be a slave. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. I just think it's mean spirited. But what this guy does in this book, and if you have the book in front of you, please feel free to turn to page 157. He has a whole discussion about what these words and phrases actually mean. And when it comes, and I'm not going to do the first part because it's complicated, but on page 157, like the third paragraph or the second paragraph, it says, because of this, these might be the three most important words that the father will ever say. The father is telling the wicked son, thank you for your question. Uh, it is because of this, because of your question, um, and because of you, that God made me to be free. God made me free so that I can learn, I could learn myself, teach you in the process, and build a relationship between us and come closer to God and learn. So he's turned the whole thing around and it's so fascinating he's grateful for the wicked child to question this and the father actually starts with that other expression and saying look if i did anything to cause your rebellion i'm sorry and i'm glad you're asking the question and you're here you showed up at the seder you care we're still in relationship you didn't abandon us and let's go forward together and there's a whole chapter on that so I totally recommend this. It's a very different and unusual approach. 
He's the um, husband of a rabbi. He himself is some big hedge fund person, but he's done a lot of study. And I feel his it's a very unique and interesting insight. And um, like somebody said earlier, all of Judaism is constantly changing. This is the first time I've read a review of The Wicked Child and is, have made it positive. So just throwing that out there to start, as I've just bought the book and just read the chapter last night. So um, are we ready now? Let's start by beginning to share the screen. And I'll be starting my teaching. Um, after one or two or three slides, we will uh, then come back and, and have you raise your hand and have more of an interactive. So my teaching for today, I made up a new teaching for us. Um, it's called Telling the Story of the Four Children of Passover Through Pictures. And we all know, um, where do we get these slides? Okay, so the question of, I made these. Uh, if you want me to send you a copy of these slides, I just send me an email and I'll send them or I'll ask Rose to send them to all the participants. So the Torah alludes to four children, one wise, one wicked, one simple, one who does not know how to ask. So how have these children been depicted and why? Let's go to the second slide. I'm trying. It's fine. Take your time. Oh dear. There. There we go. So many of you have studied before and know these. But for those of you who haven't, um, I've taught in the past for Levi Shah Breakfast all about the number four. And um, the number four is very prevalent, as you know, in the Haggadah. So, for instance, four cups of wine is because four times God uses four different verbs of liberation. I will take you out. I will liberate you. I will redeem you. I will carry you on my wings, whatever. But because of the four different verbs for liberation, we use um, four different cups of wine. Um, there's also a fifth verb that says, I will bring you to the promised land. So that one is the cup of Elijah. Now, four children, why? Because there's four times in the Torah where God says, when your children ask, each question is different and each answer is different. The rabbis were very, very, very concerned with education, very concerned with parenting, very concerned with pedagogy, and they love questions. So when your child asked, they also learned why did God do um, tell us four times that we should listen to questions and answer our children? And they learn from the number four, oh, it's because there's so many different kinds of children. This is to teach us that you need to treat each child differently. Each child is unique and you approach each child according to Ba'asher Husham at the level that they are at. So if a child asks you a question and they're three years old, you're going to answer them differently than if they're 10 or 12, or if they're intellectually motivated, or if they're just, you know, want a simple answer and don't bother me. There's so many different ways, but mostly to remind us that each child is different and respond to each child according to their needs. So in Exodus 12, it says, when your child asks, what does this ritual mean to you? And then you see, they actually lift the words from the Torah and they put them into the Haggadah as part of the question. That is also part of, it's a part of um, two, the, the wicked and the wise, but that's another story. You will say the Passover sacrifice to God who passed, it's about the um, God who passed over the houses of Israel when they struck Egypt with the 10 plagues. I didn't put the whole quote in, but you could look it up yourselves. Um, the second time in Exodus 13, it says, discussion about to eat matzahs for seven days tell your children saying it's because what the lord did for me when i went out of egypt so you say this for me expression also comes in the answer from the parent exodus 13 um later on it says it shall be when your child asks you tomorrow what does this mean you are to say by a strong hand the lord brought us out of egypt of the house of bondage so you see the questions are similar but the answers are always different and lastly, in the book of Deuteronomy, where everything is repeated again, when your child asks you tomorrow, what is our obligation to these laws and regulations that God has commanded you? Your answer, we were slaves to Pharaoh and the law took us out with a strong hand. So because of four different citations in the Bible about children asking, the rabbis came up with different archetypes. And the ones that they chose 2000 years ago were for children that they named 
wise, wicked, simple, and the one who doesn't know how to ask. Since then, um, every single commentary on the Haggadah has different interpretations about this. Um, I'm mostly concerned about what the wise is and what the wicked is. That seems to change the most over time. But also in this Haggadah I read from, they don't like the term wicked. And they said, we don't want to call any child wicked or evil. Um, they feel it's a harsh term. And so they want to use the word mischievous, uh, rebellious, a uh, recalcitrant, a uh, chutzpahdik, impolite, a uh, vildechaya, maybe naughty, maybe a little difficult, maybe a troublesome, maybe alienated. So they have lots of other terms. And I like each one of those better than wicked. Anyhow, there's a lot of things as you approach your Seder, how to approach these four children. And just eliciting response from your guests is very important. How are you resonating with these terms? And which of these childs might you be or might not be, et cetera. So let's go on to the next um, slide. Now, remember, the Haggadah was a written document and it really wasn't, um, didn't have pictures until we saw what the, um, Christians were doing in the Middle Ages, where they started doing these magnificent illuminated manuscripts of the Bible. So the Jews start, you all know about the Sarajevo Haggadah. We read about it in one of our book clubs, People of the Book. So um, during the Middle Ages, the Haggadahs started to be beautifully illustrated also. And you start seeing pictures. And one of the things you notice is the way the children are depicted reflects the culture that they come from. So Question number two, the first one of why four children, et cetera. The question number two, how do the pictures in the first illuminated Haggadot understand the four types of children? So this one is from the 16th century. It's called the Prague Haggadah, um, 1526. There's an extant edition of it now. It's in, I don't think it's in, it's in one of our um, Jewish repositories. So different schools and different places around the world have a lot of these illuminated uh, manuscripts. So first it was a woodcut figures, easy to print that way, making a woodcut and then printing them. And you'll notice the wicked child. So from the right, the first one is the wise. The second one is the wicked. The wicked child is a soldier dressed in showy clothes. Look, he has a big feather in his ornate hat. His body language expresses arrogant self-assurance and his black sword, you see the sword over there, pierces the woodcut frame as a threatening diagonal. So if you really look at this and study it, the, the way this, um, the wicked is depicted as someone to be fearful of and ominous. Um, the, it's dis discussed in the commentary that this figure effectively read himself out of his people by assimilated to the military culture of Europe. Now, remember, Jews were really never involved with sports, physical, military. This wasn't something Jews partook in, mostly because they weren't asked to. But also we developed into a people of learning and study and, and business people. Um, so if your kid joined the military, it's like a shanda, unless they were drafted, and um, then to, to prance around like this. So a wicked person, according to this depiction in the 16th century, is someone who cut themselves off from the mainstream of Judaism and what we held as sacred and holy. Hmm. Um, this is contrasted to the wise. And again, you'll notice these are not children necessarily. Most of the pictures um, depict the four alleged sons as adult sons. They don't necessarily have to be children. And most of the time they're pictured as adults because um, you could have an adult child. I mean, we all have adult child and there are sons and daughters. The wise child adult is represented by an elderly scholar whose body is smaller and weaker than that of the soldier. I don't get the smaller and weaker. Um, you do see the beard though and the hat and they're wearing the right garments and the hands are gesticulating as each as if they're teaching you something. And then you see the simple child who is submissive, is looking downward, um, has their hand pointing down, which is kind of odd, shoulders kind of slumped, a lack of self-confidence. And then you have this, the, um, the question, the child who does not know how to ask, 
is that one is shown as a child looking up, um, absorbed in the parent's story. Mm. So it's an interesting depiction, one of the first that we have, and um, gives you a little bit of a sense of how they view these four archetypes in the Middle Ages. Let's look on to the next slide. Um, this is um, almost a century later, Amsterdam Haggadah, 1695. Um, the Alami is the company that made the photo and I didn't know how to edit that out, so I apologize. As in many medieval Haggadot, the wicked, um, the children are represented as adults. The wicked stereotype, again, is the soldier who represents evil in two senses. One, spilling of blood, and um, two, the antitype to the medieval Jewry, which is, which is scholarly, as we talked about, and had merchant traditions. This one, in my opinion, doesn't look as evil or as threatening, but also, again, with a black sword, which is really curious, and um, ornate, really ornate hat, ornate clothes. Uh, very interesting uh, depiction of what those soldiers looked like at the time. Here you see the Hebrew underneath too, Chacham, Rasha, Tam, Veshe, No Yodei, Elish, All. So the wise, um, and this was in a commentary I read because I wouldn't have known it's Hannibal, the general of Carthage, as he swears to conquer Rome. So they seem to use a certain image as the wise one. He's confident and commands attention. So here, it's not just a scholarly figure, but a very confident like leader of its people. And conquering Rome means that you were able, although we couldn't conquer Rome, we, the temple was destroyed and Bar Kokhba was uh, destroyed too. And he tried to conquer Rome in 132. But here we have in the 1600s, almost so the late 1700s, a Jewish wise guy who's depicted as someone who was able to conquer Rome, which is, is brilliant, I think. Um, the simple child, the wicked child is a Roman soldier. Uh, the simple child uh, is supposed to be King Saul as a bashful young man about to be anointed by the prophet Samuel. He's closed within himself as he relies on his staff for support. And if he is King Saul, he really didn't want to be chosen. Ultimately, he turned out to be a good leader until he didn't do what God wanted. Uh, but it's curious they made him Tom because Saul was hiding in the donkeys. King Saul, when um, Samuel was looking to anoint him, couldn't be found. He was in the shed hiding with the donkeys because he didn't want to be made the leader. He was innocent. And Tom is more like a pure kind of innocent soul. And the one who doesn't know how to ask is, is depicted as small. Um, he's an adult who's small instead of like a child face. It's curious childlike in the sense that he is the smallest, although his hands are open as if asking a question. Um, we're gonna do one more slide and then we'll talk a little bit. So let's go on to the next one. Um, we've moved out of the middle ages now. And as you can see, so we've left the 1700s. We're now in the uh, late 19th century. There was some in between, but a lot of them were similar to what you just saw. Um, this now is question number three the wicked sun, what happens as we come to America and how is the sun now depicted? This is a Chicago Haggadah, 1879. Um, the wicked sun continues to be like a contaminant, bringing vices into the Jewish community. Yet the question is who is really wicked and who is wise? So is the wicked one the one we think he is or is the glassy eyed father the wicked or the flamboyant son. So look what you see here. You see an adult um, smoking a cigar, leaning back in his chair and pointing. The adult and the two figures in the front are in black. The three figures in the back are in white. The father, uh, the one with the turban and the um, beard probably is the father. And then you have mom. And then it looks like you have one pious son who's wearing a kippah and reading from a book. The father has a turban. The two younger children in the front do not have a kippah. And the cigar smoking man does not have a kippah. So remember at this time, we had tremendous amount of immigration in the late 1800s and a quick assimilation process. There is a generation gap between Eastern European immigrants to the US and they're assimilated and they're calling him the wicked son in the forefront is foremost. Uh, so have an adopted new fangled 
I love this expression. I just copied this from the interpretation because I love the way they spoke about it. New fangled American ways. The son smokes, dresses in black clothes and has no kippah. He's leaning back. Now you're supposed to relax, but you're not supposed to like lean back like that in your chair. There's something about separating yourself with that movement. He's pointing with an accusatory finger at his parents as if he's saying the question derisively. derisively. What is this ritual for you? Like he's at this Seder smoking, pointing like, why are we doing this again? Tell me why we have the shank bone and eating bitter earth. The simple and silent children distinguished by their hand motions, you see both of them have their hands exposed, are mesmerized by the wicked son who sits at the head of the table holding forth. And you know, you're impressed with like, you know, a son who goes out and maybe becomes a drug dealer and comes back with gold change, it impresses the younger siblings or whatever. I mean, I don't want to be racist or anything, but whatever is happening, some younger children are impressed when somebody comes back who allegedly is more successful. And then the people in white are mother, bearded father, and um, wise child with the kippah. They're dressed traditionally in um, pale white. Their body language bespeaks paralysis. They look a little passive. Nobody's even looking at the other child. They seem to be lacking in communication. You know, the person who drew this drew it this way deliberately. And the conversation seems to be dominated by the children in black, all with uncovered heads and their backs turned. It's, it's a very evocative photo, a photo, a picture. The family seems to be divided culturally and generationally. Only the wise child identifies with the old ways. All right, so um, let's go uh, unshare for a moment. And what we're gonna do now is it, you go down to where it says reactions in the lower right. You could do a hands up if you have something you'd like to ask or share. Um, Rose will unmute you or Rose will tell you to unmute yourself. So next to the bottom, participants chat, share, record. It says reactions with a happy face. If you open that, you could press a button that says share and she'll see in the chat your hand up. And then unmute yourself or Rose will unmute you and you could share. So I'm curious, so far, your responses, how many of you knew about these, um, these plates? Did, did you know about this or have you studied this, some thoughts about it, just out of curiosity? As you see, we're moving through history looking at the artwork. Don't all talk at once. All right, so- I I I Yes. To, oh, well, uh, oh, okay. Eileen, unmute, please. Uh, okay. Well, it seems to me in the last diagram that we saw, it shows what happened when the families came to America. I mean, my family too, there were about six or seven siblings of my parents and my uncles and aunts. And one family remained, they joined a reformed temple. That's how <laughs> they stayed in, but it just disappeared. We had, of course, we had we had seders, but the way of life was was the the Jewish way of life was not yeah. there anymore. And I think that's what he's trying to show in 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 that uh, drawing. Absolutely, thank you. And I see it chokes you up a little bit. You know, oh, everything it chokes me up now. It <laughs> makes us perclempt. I know. Okay. Um, other comments. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've got, oops, the plane just went. Um, I noticed that each in each of the pictures, it seems to me that the thing that draws your attention is the wicked son. They're they're the except that first one, which was really, but the, but even in the first one, the son took up most of the most of the frame. Right. So it looks like that's what's drawing us, and you wonder, it's like why. Why is that the one we're supposed to be drawn to? And it's an, such an excellent question because we're going to see the wise son changes coming up too. I think the wicked is what um, we heard from Eileen. The wicked son is trying to destroy Judaism. It's trying to step out and say, this doesn't matter anymore. Why are we bothering? It's archaic. It's not necessary. It's, we, let's move on. Let's assimilate. And that's where the fear, to akor et akol, it says, He's, he's um, erasing the essence of who we are. 
And the whole goal of the Seder is transmission. Children ask questions, we keep them engaged in order to transmit what we hold as so valuable. This idea of liberation and freedom and getting out of our own Mitzrayim and caring about others who are slaves is so essential for human beings. So those of us who love Passover and love the message are not willing to give it up. And if you have a child at the table or an adult or people who have just walked away, oh, we're here for the food, ha ha, when are we gonna eat? You know how that was. <laughs> I mean, it was really hurtful and insulting. And what are we bothering? And if, we, and if it's watered down to let's have a piece of matzah and eat, then, then what are we doing? And I think, Marion, that's the emphasis on the wicked because the wicked was the one who was challenging the well, essence of who we are and what we're and, doing. And that's actually what the Haggadah, what the Seder's about. The Seder, like you said, is about questions. And if, and, and when we are challenged in our beliefs, we, uh, we um, so, I won't say make solid, but we will, we firm up our own beliefs because once we, ch once we are checked with the other, you have to have that dialogue. And that's exactly dialogue. what this new book tells you about dad. So instead of like just saying to the child who says, what are you doing? And saying, oh, if you were there, you'd be a slave. This interpretation is saying, thank you for the question. Let's engage. Let's talk about it. This, you know, what is it about this? You know, I brought you up. I tried to teach you about what's important. What is there? Is there anything in the Seder that you still, still feel is meaningful? There's many, we all know how to engage. So the Seder is not only about questions, it's the idea of engagement and then transmission. The more you engage people and the more they feel they're involved in something meaningful, pleasurable, uh, family making connections, the more you'll keep it going. So I, that's a big part of it too. I heard Let's give someone else a chance, Miriam. Okay. Um, okay. Elaine and then Hi, Elaine. Okay, Elaine Craig Siegel. Hi. Um, in, in answer to the question about the um, wicked son, why, why so much focus? Um, there's an expression, I don't remember exactly what it is, but good deeds do not sell newspapers. You know, if you have on the Times, um, Judith and Ruth gave contributions to their women's group. That's not going to make a headline. But if a rabbi does something heinous, that would make headlines. So in some way, they're appealing to a person's natural focus on something evil. I don't think that's the whole purpose, but I think that- That's an, a wonderful insight. And so there you could see like making the wicked son a soldier with a sword who's coming out to kill you. You're right, it's sensational. I hear you. Yeah. you don't have that. Right, well, but they depict in the medieval times, they don't pick them as kids. They, they depict the pictures are always adult children. So no, you know, they are just adults who are different archetypes and different categories. The children who are reading it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any contemporary Haggadot with any military figure as wicked. You usually see them, you know, well, we'll talk about that, what you see in your Haggadah. Some Haggadahs don't have pictures, but now most of the Haggadahs do. And it's very curious what they've done in the modern times. We'll get there at the end of the slideshow. Mitzi, um, Mitzi is Mitzi next, Ruth? Uh, Rose, is any? Mitzi, go ahead. Oh, okay. There's something else about the... Um, that I, I'm seeing in a, in a universally spiritual way, in addition to a particularly Jewish way, when you depict the second son, the wicked son as a, as a soldier, you know, that can only um, control via, you know, physical and, 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 and harmful ways. You're really saying that they're wicked because they have, they don't have faith. Like they're really cut off from, from God or for, I mean, the whole idea that God brought, uh, that God brought us out of right. Egypt, not right. Moses, not Aaron, but right. God right. was at the helm. God's the soldier. So, so the wicked one like forgot that. <laughs> he, that's he a very good, that. that's a beautiful and good point. And that's actually a segue to the next slide because the physicality is something we minimize. And you're saying the wicked, the soldier, you know, is the physical one. Look at this next slide. So, Bibaka Shah, please, with slide number six. And um, you're going to be really surprised if you haven't seen this one before, how they depict the wicked son. And also the other sons, too. Okay, so the one after this, here we go. Okay, 
So let's just look at the picture. On the right, you see a guy with a hat. It's like a modern Orthodox rabbi. I, you know, if we were together now, we could share. He, he does he look, he looks a little sleepy to me, a little bored, kind of dozing off, not very excited or animated about his studies. So that's the, the, the wise, it seems like a modern Orthodox type who is, has the book open, but does not seem very engaged. The wicked is a boxer. We'll talk about that in a minute. The simple one you see again, the shrugged shoulders, they also oftentimes depict the wicked as kind of into themselves, no confidence, like just doesn't want to be seen, looking down. And then of course you have the little guy who, who uh, developmentally as a child doesn't ask questions. So this Haggadah is um, from 1920. It's the New York, it's called the Lola Haggadah because he's a very famous uh, illustrator. This is 30 years after the guy with the cigar so 30 years after the 1800s and the immigration. So there's been a, a assimilation now, almost the next generation. Um, this is from New York, from the Lower East Side. And notice the scene has changed. So from the proud German Americans of the industrial Chicago, we turn to the, they call them schmutzy. So it was like, they said, it's almost like the schmutzy alleys of Eastern European immigrants on Spring Street. And why do they say this? And this is something I looked up and I had no idea. This is the Yiddish cartoonist called Lola. And he made the Wicked Child a boxer. It's a tribute to the golden days of Jewish boxing. And there was other names there. I only put in one, Battling Levinsky, lightweight champion of the world, 1960, 1920. Yeah, I, I got books on Jewish sports heroes, all kinds of stuff. I did not know Jewish people were famous boxers, but there was a whole slew of them. So what's happening now? And this is some of the stuff that we just heard from Mitzi. Mitzi, you must have seen my slideshow ahead of time because there's a rise now of the muscular Judaism, praising the value of sports. You know, the body, again, not this, the guy on the right getting bored of sitting still and reading his books, but go out and box, you know, go out and get a baseball, become part of America, assimilate. So the evil one is the boxer. Hmm. But in contrast to the wise, he doesn't look so bad, does he? Because the wise doesn't, in my opinion, the wise is not enticing. If we're supposed to be the wise son, well, I don't want to look so dispirited and apathetic as the guy on the right. Personally, hmm. Put up your dukes seems a lot more appealing. Anyhow, it's just curious the way you resonate with these pictures and you have to ask yourself, the person who illustrated Haggadah had a message for us. So here, I think there's a flip. The wicked is a little more attractive to us than the wise. And I think it's a cultural discussion here. I think he's making a statement that perhaps it's time for Jews to reassess what they consider as how we should be in the world in America as assimilated Jews. Mm. Oh, I heard a big sigh. Okay. Um, a buff, so our buff boxer seems willing to take on his dorky brother, who by now has no problem dressing like a modern American, um, but is still engrossed in his book. I don't see the word engrossed actually working there. I should have changed that. Oh. So the question though, who is the wicked um, and who is the wise? Is, is it a boxer, a villain, or a hero? And I personally believe that the boxer has become more of the hero here. And still, you know, they're unable to totally get away from the idea of bookish being chacham, but they're moving in that direction. You want some more? You want what? Chacham. Chacham, uh, wise, chacham. That's how you say it in Yiddish, chacham. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Then we can have some talk, uh, some conversations So hold it in. We have a huge shift here, a huge shift. The question number four now is the new, what is this new attitude with Israel? The Zionist dream, who is wise and who is wicked? And this is incredible. This is a 1955 Israeli Haggadah by the illustrator Zvi Livni. Who is wise? The Chacham now is the Chalutz, is the pioneer. He's holding Haggadah and he's pointing to a Seder plate. If you know to the lower left, there's a Seder plate in the first left thing where it says Chacham, you see the menorah. So he's surrounded by symbols of the new Jewish state. The menorah is in the, the new um, illustration of the symbol of Israel. 
Um, you see the Ten Commandments, there's a state of place, you see the Lulav and Etro. Modern Zionism, especially um, religious Zionism, totally believed in the rituals and stuff, but they changed it around. They, they fought against being a yeshiva bacher. You couldn't do all this in yeshiva. You could be Jewish, but you also have to be a pioneer. You have to work the land. You have to be in the defense. You have to, to, you have to join the army because you have to defend us. The, you know, we were surrounded by enemies. You'll notice too, he has an open shirt. You know, in Israel, it was not until I was reading like the 60s, the 1960s, that the Knesset members wore ties. And even then it was frowned upon. The new look in Israel was always open shirted informal. So this is the Chacham, the wise. Who's wise? A pioneer who's coming to Israel, keeping the rituals, but doing it in a modern Israeli way, working and um, in the kibbutz and uh, working the land and defending the country and doing it all at once. You could multitask. Who's the wicked? Look below the wise. The wicked, first of all, is leaning backwards. So separating himself a little bit from the um, tradition. He's wearing a tie and you can't really tell, but in some of the better pictures, there's money. Those are dollar bills or some other kind of bills coming out of his pocket in his shirt. And um, what is the wicked son? It's uh, the backward looking pose, dollar bill, et cetera. An enemy to socialist Zionism, shirking responsibility of the new nation, avoiding its defense and farming. So that's why you have him leaning back from the kibbutz watchtower, the shovel, the irrigation. He's going to make money on the side. He's the one who's going to do stocks and bonds and try to make a killing off the new land. But he's not getting his hands dirty and he's not participating in this new this new agenda of building the state of Israel, especially with the tie, you know, bourgeois kind of like looking after himself. The two right-hand pictures, I couldn't get to look better, so I apologize. Um, let's go to the, the one who does not know how to ask is the bottom one, the lower right. He's the Talmid Chacham. In the picture, he has a kippah. He's very timid. He's thin from spending too much time indoor with books, not outside boxing. <laughs> um, he has payas, the lower right. And he's being shown here on... Um, hunched look of a scholar. He's considered the ignorant one, unable to comprehend the changes around him. So the, the yeshiva bucher with the, you know, the picture of, the, of a text over there and a quill to write with, he's the one who is considered the one who does not know how to ask. Hmm. And the simple child over there is interesting. Um, the simple one on um, top right, is over, they have a picture of a boat coming in with all these immigrants coming off by hordes. So the interpretation was by the, by the illustrator that the simple child is overwhelmed by the number of new immigrants, is too paralyzed to engage in work at hand. The sheer number of immigrants <laughs> coming in, etc., like, overwhelming. Like, Rabbi, I kind of thought it looked like he was a dreamer. Like he was dreaming of far off places and other things. Oh, were that's not, not rooted in maybe reality. Um, I could see that, Leslie, if the boat was going <laughs> off. And I think you're projecting because you like to travel and you're a dreamer. But <laughs> as you notice, the boat isn't going off. You can't yeah, see too right. well. Those are all people coming out. Mm. But I love your interpretation. If the boat was like people were waving goodbye, I'd agree. But they just arrived at the land. So where else is there to go? It's after the war. There's still anti-Semitism everywhere. They tried to kill you. You know, you really got to stay here. <laughs> you can't really go to Europe or see anybody. There's, you know, it's like post-World War II. Anyhow, this is so fascinating. And many secular Zionists took pride in being the wicked child. Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, written by the illustrator commenting on why he chose these designs. They were proud of themselves. And... Um, they wanted, they were, it was a rebellious secular movement. Zionism asked, what does this old Jewish practice, which leaves you in emasculated and you know, decrepit Eastern European exile mean to you? So you, you know, the Zionist movement had different parts to it. The secular Zionistic movement was more like the wicked. The bourgeois maybe is seen more as the secular Zionist because they don't want the old ways. But in this picture, the illustrator said, no, you could be a religious Zionist. You could do both. 
You don't have to be like lambs to the slaughter, staying in the yeshivas and being killed. You could come, you could be strong, you could work the land and you could keep the tradition. So you see a lot of things changed around here. This is very different than some, some of the other depictions and it reflects a change in culture and it reflects some of the attitude of early Zionism in Israel right after World War II. Isn't it fascinating? I just love this stuff. Um, let's move on a little bit more before we talk. Getting a little late. Let's do the next one. Oh, this one breaks my heart. This is the Holocaust, the four children, symbolized by the four books because we were called the people of the book. In 1984, this Haggadah came out and the whole Haggadah has barbed wire and this and that. This Haggadah was in memory of the Holocaust. The um, illustrator was named David Wander. Wander. The four children in the Haggadah in memory of the Holocaust reflect different attitudes towards Jewish tradition. So the wise child is the open book with letters to be read and studied, lower left. The wicked child, the tradition burns up as it is destroyed. The association with Nazi book burning is chilling. The wicked child is the one who wants to burn the tradition and the tradition was burned. Not necessarily because of the wicked child, but that's ultimately what happened. And it's an interesting mixture. I want to get rid of the old ways. Well, here you had your wish come true and it's all burnt to the mm -hmm. ground. So it's a very layered response. Um, the simple child, the book is open since he's still asking questions, but the child himself is blank, unlearned. And um, the fourth child, Judaism is a closed book, the lower right. The child awaits someone to open the book and the pupil um, and the pupil to one another as Haggadah advises, you will open up. So the answer to the child who can't answer is open him up, invite him in, figure out ways to get him interested. The Exodus story for the child who does not even know, you have to figure out how to get that book open and make a kid interested. I, this one is just heart wrenching. Um, it is getting late and I'd like to talk after we finish the slide. So let's just go on to the next. Um, okay, so we go from the horror to the uh, really interesting for Levi Shah. Here we go. This one um, again comes. This one is in this book that I that I really like. Um, you know, the night to remember. So they came up with this. It's it's Israel from two thousand and six. It's too easy to sort, and they wrote this down in the in the Haggadah. It's too easy to sort people. This is in their commentary into a few chosen types. The American poet, William Carlos Williams said, we take two labels of all kinds with too much zeal. We crave certainty. We love to put a period at the end of a sentence and that is that. But take a look at people, a real close look and you'll find inconsistencies and contradiction. And that's where a closer look is needed, not a category or a period. So what I'd like to do now, because nobody told us who's who, I want to see what you think. There's the, they won't tell you in the book. They said, you figure it out. So I want some responses now. Let's get four or five people um, either raising your hand, unmuting. Tell us who you think is, let's start with um, the wise child. Which one do you think is supposed to be wise? And which one do you think is really wise? I'm open to suggestions because I have to tell you myself, I... Every time I look at this, I come up with different responses. <laughs> All right, unmute, jump in. Leslie, go ahead. I think the uh, one on the far left is meant to be the Chacham. I kind of see them in order. The, um, the, the wise as being the one looking at the Talmud and with the kippah, and then the next one being the rebel. Right. The rebellious child. And then... Um, the simple one in the yoga pose. Uh-huh. Then the yoga pose and the one who hasn't a clue is sitting there with the earphones and the, you know, just right. not make it. You I know. wonder what kind of drink she's having. I'd like one. No connection to it at all. Right. Uh, thank you. Anyone want to contradict? If you don't agree, jump in. I who do. sees it differently? <laughs> Mitzi, go ahead. I, I, my first take is that our yoga pose lady is the wise one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is not because she's doing yoga. It, I mean, that's part of it, obviously. But right. but the, the one on the far left with the kippah, the Talmud, and the briefcase, 
Um, my husband just asked me to keep my voice. Down. Um, the brief, the, the, um, sorry, the Talmud, the the kippa, and the briefcase says to me that she is off in a million directions. And the one thing that I wonder is, is she really present to any one of them? Whoa, you know, nice. And the one who's sitting there kind of off the, the ground is more present and balanced and aware of who, who she is. Right, I can't see the title of the book of the book she's holding, but-, but I don't know if there is a title. Yeah. Oh, I think <laughs> it might that? say Kabbalah. Like Kabbalah. Kabbalah okay. with meditation. Yeah, that's what it says. Ah, okay. So, oh, I, so I, yeah. vote for, I vote for lady, levitating lady. Levitating um, lady is the wise one. Okay. Wise More one. comments. Yeah. Thank you. I love this. Who else wants to jump in? Joy here. I, I absolutely agree with Mitzi. But a, another issue on the Chacham lady is that she has payas too. <laughs> I didn't even notice. She has, she could have it all, huh, Joy? She has the payas also. Well, you know, totally masculine, you know, her, her shoes uh, traditionally, yeah. She, yes, but she has a ponytail. So do the guys, right? Yeah, they have ponies also, you're right. Thank you. Okay, more comments, jump in. Yeah, I think the one on the ground with the drink is uh, wicked has the wicked one but i think what they say is true is that there are aspects of all of it all of this and all of us all right we're gonna get there but, but we're not the there yet one, yeah. the wicked one because that one is the one that's completely assimilated right she's got the drink she's got the she's got the thing for the television set right you know so she's, she's not doing the kabbalah with meditation no. she's not even close to judaism right. she's like totally gone the one the one with the no animal test is actually doing social justice and all this so is actually doing <laughs> something that is right uh, so some people think the one i personally think the one with the animal testing could be also the wise she cares about the cl climate she right. wants to make a difference in the world and you could do that you don't see her here with association to judaism but i bet she would show up at the seder <laughs> okay more comments jump on in thank you this is great anyone else come on there's a lot of us on here 27 participants. Didn't we have more? Did people already get off? Oh. Comments? Anything else? Okay, so I think the wise is the one protesting. And um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think the wicked, I agree, might be the lower right. But I don't I think the child, that child lower right is just in a rebellious stage. You know, let's give someone a break. And I, I wouldn't call the middle one simple, levitating. I mean, to levitate, you're not simple. You have to have some wisdom to know how to do that. I don't know what to make the one on the left. Definitely striving. Um, I don't necessarily think it's wise, but I think this person really is ambitious, uh, connected, and wants it all. Wants to assimilate and be a part of tradition at the same time. And is trying to make it happen. And, and, she, has a nanny, and she has a full-time nanny at home for the kids. Really? And I think she's holding a computer. Not, the briefcase is not a regular briefcase. It looks right, like a probably briefcase. a computer. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Thank you, Rose. All right. So this is what Marion was alluding to. The um, conservative movement years ago, 1982. Um, I was still in rabbinical school when this came out. This is the first time did this. This is one of the contemporary ways to see the four children. It's talked about in uh, many commentators. Um, the Rebbe spoke about it, Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi Sachs, all talk about, you really can't categorize the, um, there's a little bit of these different four archetypes in us at different times in our lives. And um, so the contemporary views, questions, stereotypes, and judgmental categories all together. And with that, the conservative movement came out with this very radical Haggadah, which showed you um, the, the picture here where you could see there's a, look how mixed, messed up it is. There's a little bit of all of it. Everybody has a little bit of all four categories at one time, sometimes all at once. I could be wise and rebellious and simple. And sometimes I just don't know what to ask, you know? So rather than categorize and judge, they wanted us to really think that it's all of us. And there's other types of children, eager, hostile, passive, bewildered. You know, call yourselves different names. Don't just leave it narrow, open it up. At different points in our lives, we have been all of the children. 
We have asked clever questions. We have challenged provocatively wicked. If you're challenging something, it doesn't mean that you're bad. Maybe mm. it needs to be challenged. I marched against Vietnam, military industrial complex, you know. Um, we have uh, simply wanted to know the answer. So we have been so confused. Um, we have been so confused that we could not speak. We have been all of these children. Leslie, are you okay? Yeah, just allergies. So the um, idea then is here, one who is aware, one who is alienated, one who is direct, one who is silenced. Just different terms that I found to call these children. Someone who's aware. Uh, there could be a, a child who's alienated, someone who's direct, confrontational, and someone who's silent. Just different types. And I think we really, especially now with all our hashtag movements, we have to really question and be aware of stereotyping, of making assumptions and judgments. And I think we really need to crack open. First of all, we don't call them sons, they're children or adults or just people. There's four different kinds of people. And then you could open it up to your guests. Like, who are they? Where are you right now? How would you describe yourself? Not necessarily one of these four, but what mood are you in? What are you thinking? You know, I'm fearful because it's still COVID. I'm, you know, I can't, I'm anticipate. I'm, a, I'm in a state of anxiety. I'm worried about when we're going to get back to normal. It can really open itself up and lend itself to a good discussion. Let's move on to the next slide. So the question then is who are the children at our Seder and who are the adults at our Seders? How do we speak and listen to one another? At the Seder, we are curious about our own inner child. And so I have four, a picture of four delightful children, different ethnic groups, different genders. And then I found in one Haggadah this picture here, so they have the question mark in each picture. Who is the Chacham, the wise? Who is the Rasha? Who is the Tam and who lo yodea? And, you know, how do we want to answer this? And even, do we even want to have a category? So this is what I'm throwing out there as a conclusion. And lastly, quickly, the last slide, and then we can talk a few minutes. I found this recently. The four children of COVID-19. The inquisitive child. Why are people getting so sick? the compassionate child. What can I do to keep myself and others safe? Personally, I haven't met that child yet, but <laughs> God willing, there are some of those children out there. The worry child, I've spoken to a lot of these. What is the virus? What if it should be, I'm sorry, what if the virus keeps spreading and never stops? And that is, I have to change is to if, what if, sorry. Um, and never stops. And when the crisis and the resilient child, when the crisis is over, how can we prevent it from happening again? Which I think there probably are some kids who are wondering about that also. All right, we'll stop the share for now. And uh, let's schmooze and talk a little bit. I'm curious if you like this, do you feel you learned something? Can you bring some of it to your satyrs? Uh, or just share what you'd like to. Let's have everyone share a little bit. We haven't heard from everybody Let's yet. Say something. It's just a little uh, comment. Uh, first of all, yes, it's fabulous. Thank you. Uh, but the, my little comment was uh, from earlier. Um, the um, until the eighteen seventy nine Haggadah until that one, um, the concept of child. Um, is not um, universal. In other words, until the modern era, children were thought of as small adults, miniature yes. adults. Right. You're right. I remember reading that in one of the books the, um, about the 14th century. Absolutely. So they, got, well, they, went, they were put to work very quickly. They didn't have long childhood, exactly. Married off early. Yes. So Thank the, you. The representation as a quote, quote, small child is not referencing anything about being simple. It's the way of showing a child. Yes. Thank you. And you Elaine, know, what were you holding? Thank you, Gloria. Elaine, what were you holding up? <clears throat> you know, we had that wrestler or bodybuilder. Right. Books ago. The strong man was a very 
popular symbol in the Weimar Republic. Right. And there's tons of photos. Um, one of the most famous ones was Breitbart. And he has been researched by Sharon Gilliman, who was a professor at HUC and USC, a brilliant young woman. She died far too early a couple months ago. She was 60, and her work was not finished. Aww. At her funeral, the academics that worked with her, several of them got up and volunteered to finish the work so it will be there. Wow. May her memory be a blessing. She yes. Wonderful. And, and that's a fascinating study in and of itself, the role of um, physicality. I mean, the Jews, that was one of the main things during the Hanukkah story, because the Jews wanted to participate in the um, Olympic Games and go to the, um, you know, the pan, they wanted to go to the sports and do the, you know, disc throwing. And it was a big thing to go to the gymnasium. And part of the Hanukkah story was the, um, the Hasidic, they called them Hasidism, the traditionalists didn't want their children participating in the games. And, you know, and the children themselves wanted to. So it was a big distinction between what went on. And, and in fact, since a lot of the sports were done naked, they had reverse circumcision going on at that time too. So it, it's just a very curious thing, this whole um, interaction with religion and of the body. How much is in your head? How much is spiritual? How much is in the body? What does it mean to really promote the body versus not promote the body? Thank you, Elaine. That's very insightful and worth looking into. Thank you. Hey, Linda Fleischman, go ahead, my dear. Right. I can see we are in evol evolving people. The, Jew the Jews are evolving so that each generation has a different Haggadah reflecting on the current time so that the Haggadah of our childhood is like not there. We've got a new one now. And if we're alive, alive for the next generation, we'll see even a newer one that we couldn't conceive of at this exact moment. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get across. Thank you. I, I just go crazy when I see people still using the 1950 Haggadahs. It's like, no, it's, it's changed. It's evolved. Let's move on. The discussion is different. You know, you keep the essence of what was and you open it up. And that's what they've done in every generation. Thank you. Gladys, did you want to share? Okay. Eileen? Can't hear you, Eileen. I think we're forgetting something. We're, human beings are very complex. And I think that we're made up of a little the, the the wise one, a little of the wicked one. So you, the categorization bothers me because that's not real life. Right. And especially as an educator. So I think what they were trying to do, though, is just show us that you have to treat children differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might think of your child or an adult at the table as more wicked, but try to open it up a little bit more and be inclusive and see who they are. But at different times, we do have, we do think of our children differently yes, or people yes. we know differently. And that's, and again, they had to react. The rabbis were reacting to the idea of four questions in the Torah mm -hmm. and why the number four. So they came up with that. But I agree with you. Yes. Uh, Linda, please. I just wanted to bring up the point that for all the, uh, the wicked said was wicked, contrary, whatever, he was still showing up at the Seder no matter which generation. <laughs> exactly. So how there was still a chance to bring them in and they weren't that alienated that they didn't come. How many, I have a folder called jokes for Passover and I was going to start with a joke, but the jokes are so old. But there's one joke where the father gets from Miami, gets on the phone or wherever, probably from West Palm Beach, I'm sorry, but gets on the phone and tells the kids up north, um, oh, I have something to tell you. Um, don't tell your mom, I'm going to divorce her. I haven't told her yet, but things are just not going well. And I just wanted you to know, I know we've been married 55 years, but probably going to be divorced soon. And so the kids say, okay, we'll come right down. Don't do anything. And he hangs up the phone. And then um, he says to his wife, who's standing there, so what are we going to do next year to have him come to the Seder? 
<laughs> so yes, they show up. <laughs> I guess that's still a good joke, huh? <laughs> that was so, funny. Um, Rabbi, yeah, I've had... seen that one where they discussed somebody being ill in the family. Right. And that's bringing them together. Right. The same type of a thing. Yeah, yeah but a being similar Ill, joke, the theme, right? Bringing them and the family yeah. together. Uh, Rose, yeah. were you saying something? Um, I was going to say we've had some requests for you to put the author of Telling in, or to, in the chat or, or just announce the author. Um, okay. So Mark, M-A-R-K Gerson, G-E-R-S-O-N. And he actually calls himself um, Rabbi's husband. <laughs> he has a podcast called Rabbi. He sounds like a really cool guy. The Rabbi's Husband is a popular podcast, which I haven't heard yet. He's married to Rabbi Erica Gerson, and they have four children and live in New York City. But he himself is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, founder of the Gerson Lehrman House, African Mission Health. He sounds like an amazing guy. And believe me, he knows more than I do. His use of sources and the way the work he did here, I was so impressed. I was shocked that he wasn't a rabbi because his wife must have helped him a lot with this. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, Lee Fisher please I just want to say I've seen him interviewed twice because he's he's pitching his book now and he is very good friends with Cory Booker and I, I saw him in an interview with Cory Booker he's been studying for a very long time he's a very very bright guy they went I think he went to Harvard he must so, be very articulate huh Lee it was it was very very interesting are you enjoying the book also well, I haven't really started it, but, okay. I, I, but I'm it's, going to. I yeah, it's, it's a different kind. Of, I know that it, as I started reading, I realized it's not a rabbi and I had to go look it up. He had the sources, but he approaches it. It's a very different book than anything I've read right. because he's approaching it from a new angle. And I, I recommend it. It's delightful. That's because he's not a rabbi. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. But he's using the same sources we would use, but interpreting them differently. I don't have the second screen up. If somebody has the high hand on screen two. Marion wants to speak. Okay, go ahead, Marion. Okay, uh, two things. One, I do think that part of it is to look at each part of ourselves when we're going through this. So the, the wicked part of ourselves, whatever. And, and I, I don't like that word either. But that, that part of ourselves, look at all those different parts of ourselves and examine that. The other thing is I, I had a, there were several really wonderful teachings that I've had in the last couple of weeks, but one of them was really amazing, which is, you know, it's called a Seder, which of course is order. And the teaching was that it's really about disorder. It's, it's about breaking up the order, stirring right. things up, you know, right. making the pie get all over the place so that we do question and we do, we do figure, you know, try and figure things out and, uh, and for ourselves to make them real for us for ourselves. And also, you know, so nothing stale. And you all know that uh, rabbis have been doing this for years. It started like Susanna Heschel putting the orange on the table for um, lesbians and, you know, transgender for LBQ rights. I don't have the number, the letters right. Oh, yeah. But so it started with that. They put chocolate on a Seder table, potato peels for Holocaust. Um, I remember Rabbi uh, Finley saying he took a power drill once and put it on the Seder table, uh -huh. just so people would ask, like, new, very based. Why is there a power drill on the Seder table? And then you start talking about it. Um, also a slinky somebody put once on a Seder table. But yes, um, the idea is engagement. Too often we just read the words. It's just not there. Oh, there were four rabbis in B'nai Brock and they stayed up all night and talked. Well, like, huh? What? Why do you stay? I mean, I stayed up till three in the morning finishing the PowerPoint. So why would you stay up all night and talk? Um, when I'm engaged, I am so engaged. I can't stop. I, I know that once I start a project, I'm not going to stop until it's done. So, uh, you know, you, that's a great way to talk. I mean, why were they up all night? And then if you really want to know why they were up all night, because it's the only time they could study because the Romans wouldn't let them study. You know, so there's, there's so much you can learn if you ask the questions. And how do you tear the Seder apart? I, I think it's, it's a curious question because you don't, you still want the order, but you want to create engagement. So if it means a little disorder within it, but if it's such a disorder that you don't complete it, then you're missing the transmission. 
You're missing the completeness of what we're trying to transmit. And there's so many different themes because, you know, the story is not told in a linear fashion, but there's like impressions of the story. And there's also really important if you have kids to do the kids songs and all that. And finally, there's that idea of Dayenu, that what we're grateful for, it would have been enough. So you can't leave these out because it's so important for us to realize how much we have. And even though we don't have everything we want, Dayenu, it's enough, you know? So many pieces here that we just don't want to ignore or throw out. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Joy here. Joy, go ahead. I, I, and, and backing up with Marion, this is how you start the Seder off. The matzah is broken and hidden to re-engage at the end. And it's not finished in, until you do. Yeah, a, a couple of other points. Uh, Haggadah that I loved at least a couple of decades ago was the Santa Cruz Haggadah right. because right. that was really in the generation. And I would start reading it days before to, to be ready, whether it was the leader's edition right. or, and, and the one- That's that a I real read, hippie Haggadah, if any of you I don't know about that one. Love it. And Karen Rokar, the author is divine. I, I personally right. love her. Uh, the, the Haggadah I looked at just yesterday, brand new, is the Chabad Haggadah. And that one is lively. It shows the gal in there with her book. Uh, it does look like the four children are males, but it's a little abstract. Is that I, the one that's online now, the Chabad yeah, virtual? Yeah, yeah, you can download it, no charge. Because it, um, there aren't that many virtual Haggadahs online, and I'm very grateful. I looked at that one, too. It was good. It, I agree. It, Good, it's lovely. So pictures. Now, the thing that interests me is that in the past, the only, and I, you know, being a Chabadnik, I go into a lot of Chabad homes, and you would only see the picture of the Rebbe hanging on the wall. Nobody else, you know, we even with the right. not good feeling about having any image of it. So it's interesting that in this one, although not life size, which is I think the issue that you have all the pictures, real clear pictures, drawing sketches of female and males. Yeah. So, yeah. I think they realize, especially if you're doing it virtually, you need engagement. That's how you get people to hook in. Yeah, t t totally. Thank you. But Thank you. Another thing with, with one of the scenes you showed, those gals, the four wonderful women, they had no dresses on. They all had pants on. Very curious. Yoga or Talmud, right. Rach, all, right. all. Pants. I had another slide I left out of four women, but it's like a bubby. She's wearing a dress. <laughs> yes, but and a modern woman and a young mother with like a baby. And it was a really funny, like four generations. All right, any other comments? This is great. I really enjoyed this. Elaine, you've been so wonderful today. I've loved your insights. Go ahead, honey. I'm responding to you. Um, here's my short comment. We need to put up some kind of advertising that says, give up social isolation, join a Seder in your neighborhood today. Amen. Amen. I hope everybody here is going to either be with someone or Zoom, however you're doing it, but please make sure you have a Seder. I um, have an invitation. Right. Rabbi, did you say that you were going to send us out those um, slides or could um, you? Rose, if I send you, do you have, have the attachment it. already? I have Rose it. has it. If um, you want to just, can you send it to the participants? Does everybody want it or do you want to just email me uh, if you want it? Does anybody not want it? Well, I'll send it to everybody. Send it um, to the no, participants. I really don't know who. Um, feel who free. Here. I mean, I, I got this stuff offline. Oh. I've been reading my other material. So feel free to use it if you want. Uh, you know, just say that Rabbi August put it together. That's all. What format? Oh. It's um, public satyrs online. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, different temples. Our mm -hmm. temple has one if you want. We're doing ours Friday night. If you want, I can send you a link. We have a children's Seder and a, young, and a family Seder. Family you know, I'm going to do a Zoom Seder Friday night. If you just send me an email and I can send you the temple link. Thank you. Okay. I All right. I want to bless everybody with a Chag Sameach, a very joyful um, holiday. And please know that, you know, get your vaccines. I'm sure you have already. 
And um, we're getting back to seeing each other, hopefully live at some point, but delightful to be here today. Um, Linda Zweig, I'm so glad. Do you have your hand up? You want to say something? So good to see you. Um, you need to unmute. Thank you for doing this, Rabbi. It was wonderful. Thank you. And Linda, are you talking to us? There you go. And I see Joy Schechter here. We haven't seen you in ages. Hi. I want to say thank you for, for new insights to a story that's 3,500 years old. Um, <laughs> I don't look as old as I am. I, you know, remember what uh, Zalman said to, to um, the Dalai Lama? How do you keep your people together when you're so spread out? Right. Zalman said the Passover story. Yeah. 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 So I, I forgot that answer. You're right. And that's what this is all about. However you get people engaged. Yeah. The answer. And it's delightful, isn't it? To learn something new. That's what, that's what my goal was for this. So I think I accomplished our goal today to really learn something new. Yeah. And send, I would like the link to your Friday night Seder. Okay. I'll make a note to do that. You got what, it. What was the answer though? Somebody's phone rang and I didn't catch the la that line. Oh, the answer, Linda, tell us again what Zalman said. The answer is the Passover story. There we oh, you. thank you. Okay. Linda, you look fabulous. Okay, I want to thank everybody. This has been so delightful. So blessings, kisses, and hugs. And until we meet again, have a very um, a decent Pesach, a very joyful, happy, healthy Pesach. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.